Let's uh, talk about the secrets of magnetism and all the disinformation and misinformation that was taught to us in schools and college. We're of the belief, the false belief, that a magnet has poles. A magnet does not have poles. As Faraday called magnetism, he called it the dielectric field. The loss of that inertia necessitates a toroidal reciprocation. Now these are called lines. But line is only a linguistic tool used to imprint a pattern into human consciousness so that we think we know what we're talking about. Well, at a certain vector we have a supposed line of force. And if you cut that against a copper coil, you end up with induction and power. Well, that's all well and fine, but descriptions are never explanations. There is no such thing as magnetic attraction. And as far as we think, well, opposite poles attract. Opposites never attracted. Likes always attract like. We've had this notion since the age of lodestones, and certainly so since ferrite magnets were perfected, you know, quite a long time ago. Opposites do not attract. All force and motion is curved linear. Obviously, the torus or the toroidal the reciprocating processional uh, hyperboloid that defines the geomagnetic precession of the loss of inertia which defines the magnet is of course curve linear it reciprocates centrifugally and returns centripetally to the quote unquote other side but there is not an other side and it is not an opposite side it is the lowest pressure node or null point of the loss of that inertia which manifests itself as force in motion. So force in motion is seeking, and of course seeking is a wrong word, to dissipate that force. Now let's take a look at something else here. If we take two magnets of supposed unlike polarity, we know that they will accelerate towards each other. It's like well, this is the notion that we have that uh, unlike poles attract each other. Well they're not unlike poles and they're seeking force dissipation. Now, if you take a look at the image below, you will see that I've taken a bar magnet and cut it up into three different pieces. It doesn't matter if you cut it up a thousand times, and I've already talked about this, that the plane of inertia will re-manifest itself at each one of those sections at the null pressure point between the magnitude of each one of those pieces. Whether that's a clean cut or a jagged cut doesn't make any difference you can never cut out a north pole from a south pole. It's like, well, I'm going to cut someone's head off of their shoulder, so I've cut one piece from a... A magnet doesn't work that way. It has no locus. What are the implications of something that we know is there, but it is not there, because there indicates and denotates a Cartesian manifestation at an XY coordinate? If it is not there, then where is it? It is nowhere. In the case of the top image on the chalkboard, we have two magnets accelerating, but they're not accelerating towards each other. They're accelerating towards, and you can see this underneath the ferro cell, by the way, they're accelerating towards a null point in counter space, a plane of inertia. If we know from the bottom image, which of course is accurate and correct, and redu reproducible by anybody, that you can slice a magnet a million times, and you'll end up with a million new manifestations of a plane of inertia, Therefore, the plane of inertia is nowhere. It is in counter space. In, we still have a linguistic booby trap. In, where, at. There is no plane of inertia located at the middle of a magnet. That is the null point between magnitudes, between temporal displacement. Now, time is a human invention. Time does not exist. It is only the measure of magnitudes. So, in the case, and you can see this underneath the ferro cell, taking a look at the top uh, diagram here, the two magnets are accelerating towards a null point in counter space. They're not accelerating towards each other. Oh, why, sure they are. No, they're not. The plane of inertia, the sink, the countersink for the dissipation of those force modalities, it doesn't matter if it's the north and south or south and north, it's the dissipation of the force. Opposites don't attract. Likes attract. We have this notion embedded in our brains since preschool. Mosquitoes are biting me. 
that likes attract. They don't attract. It is force dissipation. Force multiplicatives, i.e. additive. Okay? We talk about like a brick wall versus a chain link fence. Now this is the part you should pay attention to. This is definitely the case that field coherency is the multiplicative of force, not the additive of force. When it comes to fields and coherency, they are not additive, they are multiplicative. You know the ancient Roman, um, they talk about the Roman army, and I'm going to break a stick off of a tree here. One of the ancient symbols of the Romans, which indicated one soldier, was a bundle of sticks that were tied together. Now, it's not too hard to break one stick, right? Well, my arm's kind of weak, and this is a bit thick, and I can't do one. It's easy to break one stick, but you tie a bundle of sticks together, strongest man on earth generally can't break it. They become multiplicative. They become more than the sum of their parts. This all leads back to black holes. We know for a fact that when a sun starts to die, it produces iron. Iron is the death knoll, the death gasp of a star. Once a star produces iron, it's over with. And if the mass is large enough and becomes coherent, then mass, and this is a completely foreign concept to stupid humans everywhere, is that mass and magnitude become completely displaced from each other, where we actually have acceleration overriding force and motion. We actually have a mass, a supermass, with zero magnitude. It has no Cartesian value. Well, it's a black hole. Well, I've talked about this before in a few videos. How is that possible? It's really simple. Mother Nature is not complicated. What we have is acceleration actually overriding the value of force and motion such that acceleration is so high it has overthrown and crossed the threshold whereby which magnitude and mass can exist. It has no temporal magnitude. You know, this is an entity we call a black hole. Well, that's kind of meaningless. Let's take a look at something else here. Temporal displacement. Zero temporal displacement in a coherent field below here. We're looking at field coherency in a magnet at the very bottom here. Something that has zero temporal displacement has zero magnitude. What we have here is the multiplicative of force. There is no such thing as gravity. That which we call gravity is nothing other than incoherent dielectric acceleration. That which us stupid humans call magnetic attraction and that which we call gravity are one and the exact same damn thing. Dielectric acceleration. Up here we have incoherent matter. Let's say the earth, the moon, a rock, whatever it is. Here we have five and five. We have temporal displacement. Five and five equals ten. Well, down here we also have five and five. Except down here we have the multiplicative. We have five and five doesn't equal ten. It's five times five equals twenty-five. Five and five equal ten. We have temporal displacement up here. This is incoherency of a field such as any mass, other than a black hole, by the way, where temporal displacement becomes zero, and there is zero magnitude. I can't calculate the exact size, but we could create, if it were possible, a black hole, if we were to create a super gigantic neodymium magnet, maybe like one-tenth the size of the Earth, and charged it up with enough power from, more power than we certainly have we would create a, a uh, acceleration whereby which magnitude uh, would vanish. There would be a complete divorce and overthrow of the barrier. I've got a mosquito biting the hell out of me. <laughs> would overthrow magnitude. Multiplicative additive. Additive multiplicative. Five and five equals ten. This is incoherent matter. Down here we have a multiplicative. Five times five equals twenty-five. Pretty simple, isn't it? The only thing that defines a magnet is field coherency. And coherency of fields, just like a laser, is multiplicative. Five watts, five watts of ambient illumination is not even enough to read a book by. But a five watt laser 
It will scorch the back of your eyeballs out and it will burn a hole right in your damn ass. That is undeniable and irrefutable as well. So, we know that the plane of inertia does not exist at the center of a magnet. It has no Cartesian value. Okay. So what does that mean? The plane of inertia has no locus. In the example of two magnets accelerating, as I've told you, they're not accelerating towards each other, apparently they are, but they're accelerating towards a forming null point of inertia, where force is at its lowest pressure point in inertia. Inertia is pure potential. It is unmanifest. I don't care if you call it inertia. I don't care if you call it counter space. I don't care if you call it the effing ether. It doesn't matter what you call it. They're all one and the same thing to describe the exact same thing. Humanity does not understand magnetism. Well, at least it does now, hopefully. Some of them do. By the way, my buddy from uh, Europe sent me this shirt. You can see it's Nikola Tesla I'm wearing on my shirt here. Thanks for the t-shirt. He sent me two of them. The other one was too small. And my mother is wearing that t-shirt. <laughs> So, thank you for the t-shirt. See, I'm wearing Nikola Tesla on my t-shirt. I thought you'd get a kick out of that one. So, opposites don't attract. Force is multiplicative. The plane of inertia can be between two magnets, not at the nexus of the magnets themselves. It's already established that the plane of inertia has no locus, since you cannot find a coordinate for the plane of inertia, nor can you cut it out. If you slice a magnet a thousand times, the remanifestation of the plane of inertia will exist a thousand times, a million times. Inertia has no Cartesian value because it has zero temporal displacement, it has no magnitude, and anything without a magnitude has no locus. Herein also is the confusion of the notion of a black hole. A black hole has no magnitude. It is supermassive, yes, but it has no magnitude? Well, that doesn't make any sense. Something that's supermassive must have magnitude. No. The ancient Greek word topos, or place. A black hole is a supermass that has no topos. It has no place. You cannot find it because it is nowhere. Anything that has a where, a place, or an at, or a location is something that has magnitude. It has temporal displacement. When acceleration crosses the threshold over which by it overthrows magnetic force divergence, then something can be both supermassive and yet have no magnitude. This is very simple. The fundamental cosmic mechanics of Mother Nature are so simply divine that they're so simple that common humanity in its ignorance and stupidity has not yet comprehended how simple it is. It's that simple. It really is that simple. Not simplex, but it is really simple. Opposites do not attract. A magnet does not have poles. There is no plane of inertia located, located at the center of a magnet. It is simplex field pressure mediation. Do you know what an hourglass looks like? you know what an hourglass shape looks like? It's got two bulbs and a really tight choke point right at the center of an hourglass. Everybody knows what the F an hourglass looks like, right? We count the passage of time from the beads of sand that pass from one bulb to the next. Imagine that neck point being infinitesimally small. At that point, there is no passage of time. At the center of everything that moves and everything that is, there is not that thing. At the center of quote-unquote gravity, there is no gravity. At the center of magnetism, there is no magnetism. It does not exist. If you place a gauss meter between two powerful magnets and smack them together with the gauss meter still in the center between the magnets, you will register zero magnetic flux because there is no magnetism there. Lux e veritas. If you like this video, you could always make a donation or send me a big fat pizza. And I want to thank my buddy for sending me this shirt of Nikola Tesla. Okay? Thanks for watching.